Um, sorry about the mic, I'll try this. Um, I'm Erica McNamara, the director of the Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse. Welcome to our 11th annual meeting. I'm going to say a few words, um, acknowledge some of the folks that are involved with our coalition. Then we'll have District Attorney Ryan speak, followed by Dr. Ruth Cody. So thank you all for being here tonight. I know how busy the month of September can be with back to school and all of the events and everything that our kids have going on. So thank you for taking the time to be here. Really do appreciate it. Just want to say um, a thank you to Julian DeAngelis who helped coordinate the event for tonight. Um, we booked Dr. Cody, I think maybe six months ago. <laughs> her, her, she's very uh, in demand. And so we're very pleased that um, you all came out tonight to see her. I also want to thank our board of directors. If I could just ask our board members to stand up for a minute. Um, just so sorry. <laughs> to all the excitement. Um, just want to say thank you to, to all of our board members. John Halsey from the Selectmen, Rich Hand from the Recreation Committee, Chief Sagala from the Police Department, Bob Lulashur, Town Manager, Elaine Webb, our Parent Representative in the School Committee, J Jen Hillary, one of our Parent Representatives, Pat Shannon, also a Parent Rep, Joanne Sanders, Freelance Reporter, and also a Parent, um, and did I miss anybody? Okay, that's everybody, thank you so much. Oh, John, board member. Oh, is that better? Okay. All right, um, just want to say a little bit about our coalition and how we're funded. Um, this is our 11th year as a coalition, our ninth year as a funded coalition. Our primary source of funding is the Drug Free Communities Program, which is through the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, as well as the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. As we are in our ninth year, the program is a 10 year program. Um, after next year, we will be, need to be self-sufficient, um, self-sustaining. So what that means is we need to look for other sources of funds. Um, we've done a lot of work over the years to show um, the amount of work that a coalition can do with the right resources. So we want to just let you know kind of where we are in our funding status and encourage you to support us as we move forward. Our two um, primary goals as a coalition is to strengthen collaboration and reduce substance abuse. We do that in a variety of ways. Um, there's a lot of different projects that are often going on at, um, at the same time. But mainly what we're trying to do is focus on affecting our local norms. Um, many years ago when we first started as a coalition, a group of young people um, spent a lot of time talking to other youth, talking to parents, talking to police, health professionals, people in different sectors of the community to determine what were our local norms. And what they found is we had some really positive, protective, good social norms, which were a lot of opportunity in Reading. Most kids um, are connected to family, have a trusted adult in their life. Um, many young people were pausing and thinking about their choices. On the flip side, we found that we also had some negative norms. Access to drugs is pretty easy. Access to the medicine cabinet, access to marijuana and alcohol is pretty easy. We also found that a lot of adults had generational amnesia. And the kids coined that phrase <laughs> because they felt like um, there was this disconnect between what it's like to be an adolescent and once you become an adult you kind of forget some of the stressors of being an adolescent and how tough the choices actually are. Also, um, one of the negative norms that they pulled out was a false sense of protection. That being in Reading, um, nothing bad will happen to you. Um, that idea or that perception that you're kind of in a little bit of a bubble. So I think those norms just give you a little bit of opportunity to think about some of the challenges we have and also some of the protective factors that we have. Two of the main projects that we've been working on for the last few years have been to strengthen the adult in our community. Thank you, Kevin, so much. Thank you, Kevin. Um, we um, have been working with the Active Parenting Program, um, offering that to local parents, as well as training folks in youth mental health first aid. We've trained 650 adults in our community in youth mental health first aid, so we can identify signs and symptoms um, that we're concerned about. We also operate um, a D diversion program with our district attorney, our police officers, and our local high school, um, which you're in, and a chemical health education program, which helps to identify signs and symptoms earlier so that we can intervene and young people can have access to services quicker. We sponsored Hidden in Plain Sight at the beginning of this year. Um, that was an opportunity for adults to visit the police station, look at some of the exhibits, kind of look at things to look for if you're worried about a young person. We also have been continuing our medication collection program, which we started in 2009. 
Our um, Dropbox was actually donated by the district attorney's office, and we've collected um, 1.2 million pills since 2009, and that's just a fraction of what is in Reading. That's just a tiny amount that's being turned in, but we are seeing um, people continue to drop things off, and we appreciate that. We've also been offering dissolvable pouches for those folks who may be homebound or can't get out, and so Hallmark Health has been partnering with the folks that they see in the home so that folks can use those as well. You can see that over time, we've been able to increase the amount of pill bottles that are coming into the station, but again, it's just a small amount of what, we're, what is actually out there and could be accessible to young people. We are very excited to say that for the last, I guess, eight or nine months, we've had an amazing resource, the Interface Referral Service through William James College, and we have a table um, here tonight out in the hallway if you'd like to learn more. Interface is actually kind of a matchmaking service for mental health. What we found in talking to families um, is that it's very difficult sometimes to access mental health services quickly, and sometimes you don't know what you need. So you often are making a lot of phone calls, you don't know what your insurance covers, you may not know if you need a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a licensed mental health counselor, a specialist in substance abuse, someone that specializes in anxiety. It's complicated to some extent. So what they provide is a licensed clinician answers the phone, does an intake, and then does some research to find who would be a good match for the family, and they provide two or three matches, and then they follow up to make sure that you get an appointment in a reasonable amount of time. So since we started with Interface in November of last year, we've had 60 local families access the service and get connected to mental health, which is amazing. We're very, very proud of that. Um, the majority of referrals were for our teens as well as our little ones, and then we did have some adults also access the service. But the beauty of the service is it can be for any age and you can call as many times as you need to. Um, we found that people were calling with a lot of different types of presenting concerns, everything from anxiety to substance abuse or anger, and there are often multiple presenting concerns in a um, case. Um, so there were other things that came up during the intake call. So you can see it can get pretty complicated just even in a short 15 minute intake. We also supported um, the local um, high school implementation of ESPERT, which is a new state um, law requiring local schools to do school screening. Uh, ESPERT stands for Screening, Prevent, Intervention, and Referral to Treatment. We did a pilot project last year. We screened 301 students through the nurse's office with the help of our outreach coordinator, Julianne DeAngelis, and that was very successful in reaching out and building connections with young people. We also have reached out to our local healthcare providers. What we are finding is that we've been increasing our referrals to local healthcare providers for them to maybe take a peek at what, what's going on with kids and maybe assess if something's going on. So we thought it would make sense to reach out and let them know of the changes that are happening in the state. So we just did a, a recent mailing from our chief and our superintendent, making them aware of the changes with vaping and then also with ESPER that they may see an increase in referrals. This is National Recovery Month. This is um, our last event of the month. Um, it's been an amazing month. I've met so many people. Um, we've had so many great events, and I'm just gonna share a little bit um, from those events. We had our Fall Street Fair. We were able to connect with about 100 different folks that approached our table. We had people talk to us about folks they've lost, about the trouble of getting into treatment, staying well. We also talked to people who are raising their grandchildren. Um, lots of different things, and then we also heard from people who were really happy to have a prevention coalition in town. We also hosted an event with the Chamber of Commerce, where we um, talked with local businesses about ways that they can implement policies to support their employees, and also to implement bathroom safety for overdoses. And we partnered with the Mystic Valley Public Health Coalition on Tuesday night to, to um, offer our fourth annual candlelight vigil and rally for recovery. And we had some great partners from around the state at that event. And we also were able to honor some folks that we've lost. One of the highlights was having some of the folks from Jams for Jake at our event. And so next I'd like to invite up Allison Steger and Lauren Anderson to talk a little bit about a project they've been working on in memory of someone that our castle loved and they also loved very much, um, Jake Cizwa. Thank you, Erica. Um, my name is Lauren Anderson, and this is Allison Steger. And um, we are part of a group of individuals that we have been calling ourselves Friends of Jake. 
Um, and we all share in common that we lost a very dear friend of ours um, to overdose in the end of June, um, Jake Suzwa. And um, kind of uh, immediately after he passed, we had this idea um, to hold a music festival um, because it was something that he had always talked about. He loved music um, and was really talented at it and um, was always encouraging others being very supportive of um, everyone's uh, creative efforts. So um, we really wanted to make that vision a reality and also um, make people aware not only of um, the incredible talent and community that already does exist um, in Reading, but also of um, the resources that are available to people who are struggling um, with addiction um, and mental health issues and um, just kind of uh, provide a sense of community um, that there is support and um, there are a lot of people kind of in this fight with you um, that are all pulling for you. Um, so it's looking to be a really fun um, celebratory day. Um, it's going to be at Simon's Field, October 29th. Uh, gates open at 11. We have a lot of local music talent and um, some artists that are going to be providing some art for us. Um, and we've had really incredible community support um, for the event. Um, I think Allison. Yeah. yeah, no, so it's being from Reading, this has been an amazing experience to try to get an event run in Reading because we've actually had an outpouring of support with the town board, the board of selectmen, the Rotary Club, who was one of our premier sponsors. Reading uh, Co-op Bank, which is one of our gold sponsors, as well as Eastern Bank, who's another premier sponsor. Um, everyone has just been so supportive, and everyone we've talked to has been, I can't believe you're doing this, this is going to be amazing. It's a free sober event, and it's really just trying to bring everybody together for a positive experience out of something that wasn't necessarily that positive, right? So um, we're just really excited about it, and we have these little flyers, if you guys would like to take one, just so that you guys know when the event is. And we have our website at the bottom, so if you'd like to learn any more about it, or if you know someone who might be interested in sponsoring, please uh, email us, because I take care of that, and I'll be more than happy to talk to them. So, thank you. Thank you so much. So next I'd like to um, say a few words about Mary Ryan. We're so thrilled that she's here with us. Um, we work with Mary Ann through her opioid task force for the Eastern Middlesex area. Um, our police officers work with her office day in and day out and she's been on the forefront of the opioid crisis. Um, she was elected to office of district attorney for Middlesex County in 2014. She is the only female district attorney in the state of Massachusetts. Her own life experience has given her a deep and broad understanding about law enforcement, victimization, and the judicial system. She lectures and leads workshops to raise awareness of the dangers of prescription drug abuse, teen dating violence, bullying, and distracted driving. She's been acknowledged for her leadership on the opioid crisis and on developing initiatives aimed at keeping children safe and protecting our seniors. She and State Senator Jason Lewis, in partnership with Hallmark Health System, developed the Eastern Middlesex Opioid Task Force that focuses on combating the increase in drug overdoses in Eastern Middlesex County, serving the communities of Malden, Medford, Melrose, North Reading, Reading, Stoneham, and Wakefield. This year, she announced a first of its kind partnership with Project Linus to provide blankets to children who've experienced trauma, such as being a witness to a parent or loved one suffer an overdose, witnessing a violent crime, the loss of a parent or sibling, or displacement from their home. It's my pleasure to welcome Mary and Ronnie. Thank you, good evening. Thank you to Erica for that warm introduction, and I want to thank the Ready Coalition Against Substance Abuse for having me here tonight. You know, the coalition under Eric, Erica's leadership has really been partners with us in all that we've been doing, and she mentioned the task force and some of the efforts that we've been doing, and Reading has really been an integral part of that. And as well, and you know, sometimes we take this for granted, and I know for everyone who's here tonight, it's hard to have been busy all day to get everybody dinner, to get yourself back out again, hope the homework's getting done at home while you're here, all of that piece, so I truly appreciate that, 
But one of the things that is very easy to overlook is the wonderful officials, town officials, school officials that you have here. I could not do in Middlesex County what we do without the support of our police chiefs and our superintendents. They are amazing partners. And we take that for granted sometimes. And I can tell you when I talk to my colleagues across the state, that is not the case everywhere. They are not all out here at night at these meetings the way you see folks here. They are not all coming to the meetings, to the task force. Erica knows we have that. We meet every single month and that room is filled and our police departments, our police chiefs are there. So sometimes it's easy to think, be skeptical about government and wonder what we get. In Reading, you are well, very, very well served by your conversation. Now, I was asked to talk a little bit before Dr. Pote talks tonight about community awareness. And when I do that, I like to really draw on what we have learned in Middlesex County over the last couple of years from a community that at some point, as we were working on this epidemic, which we started doing in about 2012. And just to kind of put this in a little bit of perspective for you, in Middlesex County, we have 54 cities and towns that are diverse in every possible way. Within those 54 cities and towns, we have 26 colleges and universities ranging from some of those schools you may have heard of in Cambridge to the small community colleges that are scattered across the county as well. So we have a population that reflects every demographic. In 2012, out of that 1.6 million people, we had 65 fatal overdoses across those 54 cities and towns. And that 54 was a significant jump of about one third from the year before. And that was when it first caught my attention and we thought, what is happening? What's, what is going on with this? Since that time, we have dedicated an enormous amount of time and resources to working on this. And for a long time, what was really puzzling is, despite the amount of work that we were putting into it, we couldn't seem to turn that number around. And in fact, despite that work, every single year, in the period from 2013 to through last calendar year, that number went up. Last year, we had over 250 deaths. So from 65 to that, in a very small window of time. We are cautiously optimistic as we get to the beginning of October, that this year, for the first time since that began in 2012, we will see a significant percentage decline in fatal overdoses in Middlesex County. And that is really due to the work of everybody who has concentrated on this effort, who has bought, brought time, talent, and treasure to doing that. But there's a lot more that we need to be doing. And as we took what we've done in Middlesex, the very broad and the very deep approach to this problem, doing some of the things that all of you in this room have probably heard about, education in schools, providing Narcan, putting the prescription drop-off boxes at the police station. We did all of that, but it was clear to me, having done this for over 30 years, that we didn't get to this problem in a minute, and we weren't going to be out of it in a minute. And so we needed to be looking very hard at well, who else was affected. We didn't think initially about those kids. The staggering statistic in Massachusetts right now is there are 38,000 children under the age of 18 who are being raised by their grandparents. Now, when I first heard that number, I thought cancer, car accidents, all kinds of things that would cause children to go into their grandparents' custody. Of those 38,000, fully 80%, 30,000 are in the care of their grandparents because of opioids. Either their parents have succumbed to an overdose or their parents have become unable to parent because of that. And I would venture to guess that many of you in this room know of those situations. Well, we weren't thinking about those folks the beginning of looking at this epidemic. We weren't thinking about the toddlers and preschoolers who were going off to grandma. We weren't thinking of what we've done over the last two months, which is reaching out to three sets of grandparents out of state, really thinking they'd gotten to a place in their life where they were done raising children, and saying, first of all, your child has to come to an overdose, and second of all, your grandchildren are waiting and asking them to come back and collect those children. That's not what you expect to be doing at 75. 
And there's just a whole host of, never mind keeping up with those kids, there's a whole host of economic and logistical issues. We needed to be thinking about all of that. As we continue to see the usage among women, one of the few places where I'm not happy to see women climbing in popularity and alongside their male counterparts, we also began to see that the age at which people were continuing that use was overlapping with the age when women were having children. We have eight birthing hospitals across Middlesex County. They vary greatly in size and in the communities they serve. Every one of our birthing hospitals is delivering a minimum of one substance exposed newborn a month. Now, there's the, there's the piece of what's happening with that child and what that child goes through. There's the piece of where that child is going because many of those substance exposed newborns are leaving the birthing hospital with their 72 year old grandmother as their caretaker. There is also part of, you know, we talk about numbers because that's how you measure things, but we in this work, as we've done it in our office, really never lose sight of the fact that when you look at those numbers as they've spread across the county, every single one of those marks or checks that someone who sustained a fatal overdose reflects somebody's son or daughter, somebody's brother or sister, and increasingly somebody's mother and father. So that's the driving force, but there also is the fact that this crisis that we are in is just not sustainable. You know in Reading, as we know in every part of the county, there's infrastructure improvements that need to be made. There are all kinds of things that need to be happening. The kind of cost of this epidemic cannot go on indefinitely. And I'll give you an example with respect to those substance-exposed newborns. In Massachusetts, the birth of a child, the healthy birth of a child that we all like, mother goes in, delivers that newborn, they stay a couple of nights and everybody leaves, is under $5,000. The cost for a substance exposed newborn from the time they're born till they leave that hospital ranges between $63,000 and $97,000. So there's a piece of it that's just, we need to really be getting to the root of this problem and dealing with that. And in doing that, one of the things that became clear to me as we worked through it was that a voice we were not hearing from were folks who were in successful recovery. People who really were on the inside. What was it that had worked? Because we can't afford to keep doing things that don't work. Were there points that we could have intervened when someone did not intervene? What prompted people to actually change the route they were on and get into recovery. And so what we did was we put together panels of folks that were in fairly long-term recovery. They were all between in their 20s and 30s. And we asked them really to be a traveling forum with us, to come with us to our hospital-based task forces, where they would talk about what had happened. We would be able to ask them questions and gather that data. We've gotten a lot of very useful information it's been information that we have begun sharing, for instance, at grand, grand rounds at the hospitals, because folks talked a lot about what happened when they went to a hospital for an opioid-related condition. How were they treated? Was there stigma that caused them not to want to go back? We've begun talking with our medical staff. They talked about what was really useful when many of them had spent some time in the criminal justice system. What was an effective intervention, what was not? We've been sharing that with our law enforcement partners. And then we really learned things that have been informing our prevention work in our community piece. And I want to talk about three of those tonight. The first was that these individuals, now remember, they're all in that 20 to 30 range, the 30 age range. The vast majority of them all come from upper middle class suburban towns, very much like Reading. Most had some or had completed college. But one of the common denominators, which I think as a community and as parents is critical, was that every one of them reported early usage. They were all talking about experimentation with alcohol between the ages of 12 and 15. And that pretty quickly, that experimentation led to the use of marijuana and then often prescription pills. Now, is one causing you to do the other? Not necessarily. But what they were describing was they were in places where that was the pattern they were following. One bad decision followed another. 
That's who they hung out with every Friday night, and that's what happened. So we had that early piece, and compounding that problem was that more than half of the panel was self-reporting a predisposition, usually based on family history, to substance use. So you all know and have some information about, and I'm sure Dr. Pote will talk about tonight, the adverse consequences just cognitively and developmentally on kids of drug use, alcohol, or some other kind of drug early on. But the other piece of it is that the research is clear that the earlier someone begins to use substances, the more likely they are to develop some kind of substance abuse disorder. The longer you can keep your kids from using substances, that is, itself is a protective factor. And you know, I think this is a piece where, as parents, it means a few things. It means having continuous and candid conversations with kids about your expectations. And it means knowing what your expectations are and not being afraid to say that. I know, as the mother of two kids who are recent college graduates, how it's easier to say that than to put that into effect. But I think when you are ambiguous, or when you think, well, it's not so bad, that comes across pretty clearly to kids. So I am always astounded when parents say to me, and it typically happens in the spring, well, I don't think it will be so bad if all the kids are at my house and they drink. And I think, do you know I'm the DA? I, I'm just, you know, like I just can't figure that out. And what is your address? But that's an, that's an ambivalence that's a problem. Do you think your kids don't know that you're thinking that? I'll tell you something that was stunning. I was in a presentation very much like this about um, shortly after the passage of the marijuana question. And there was a pediatrician who spoke at great length about the impact of marijuana on the brain and showed slides. It was pretty compelling. As a parent, it was compelling. And as I always like to be at the back and say goodbye to people when the presentation's over, and there were a whole auditorium full of parents. And as people were walking out, there were so many who were kind of laughing and joking to themselves, saying, I smoked a lot of marijuana, I was okay. Really? Really? We just watched that and that's the reaction? First of all, the marijuana that's out there right now, let me tell you, is not what was out there in the 70s. Right? We continue to see kids in the emergency room, for instance, with fentanyl-laced marijuana. You just look at it, you smell it, it's clear it's not the same thing. The other piece of it, which I think as parents is sometimes hard to remember, we go out often and I'll talk with kids and we have a program we do with them about good choices which is a pretty honest discussion because shockingly, me going out and saying, please use drugs, don't use drugs, doesn't work all that well. So we have this very honest conversation with kids about here's a scenario, and there are places in the room that are divided into the yes, no, and maybe category. What would you do? And they walk off to a certain place and then we talk with them about it. And when you talk about what's the biggest influence, it is their parents. So we don't always know that, but they are listening to you. So it's thinking about what you're gonna say. It is continually having those conversations, setting the rule, holding the rule. People say to me all the time, when should I have those conversations? If you're asking me those questions, you ought to be having those conversations. My answer to that always is, why don't you ask your kids what they already know? You will be shocked at what your nine-year-old already knows. So you really can't start those conversations too early. Just about good choices, about the body, about what is safe and what is not safe. Because we used to, when I first started in the district attorney's office, would be out educating high school kids. Then we started educating junior high school kids. We're now in the middle school, we're moving back. So that conversation cannot wait until they've already found themselves in a circumstance where there's some experimentation. The other piece, and this goes along with what kind of an influence it is, so many of our panelists talk to us about the fact that they were using substances when they were in a situation that they couldn't deal with. They were having a hard time at school, they were feeling stressed, they were in the college process, there was a breakup, there was something. What are you modeling for your kids? That's the question. Do your kids see that in your house, there's too much alcohol use, there's too much substance use, because in the same way 
that you probably every one of us got a little bit more polite and cleaned up our language a little bit when we had little kids that copied what we said. They're copying what you do. So you can't really be, a, be surprised, even if you're not abusing substances, but if that's the way you respond, you come home after a bad day at work, it's a glass of wine. Something bad happens, it's a pill. You can't be shocked when that's what your kids are doing, when they are copying exactly what they have seen at home. So it is really having a hard look at your own behavior, and it is engaging in those conversations, and it's being careful about who else is doing that influence on them. The second piece that I was really very shocked to discover was such a common factor, was trauma. In the same sense that people talk to us about they didn't know how to deal with so many other things, every one of the folks we talked to in the numbers of panels we did talked about having had some unaddressed trauma in their life that they just lacked the capacity to address and turn into substances because those substances made them feel cool, made them feel smart, made them feel more productive, and that was how they dealt with it. And, you know, it's, it's really true that we can't be expecting kids to be doing well anywhere when they're trying to deal with some trauma that's going in their head. And one of the statistics that we discovered in the course of this, and you can do this yourself, it's pretty easy. Some of you might have heard, there is a test that can be given to kids. It's called the Adverse Childhood Experience Test. You can go online and take it. It's a very short test, about 12 questions. And it asks if any of these things have ever happened to you as a child. Have you ever been hit as a child? Have you ever seen one of your parents be hit? And you know, you give yourself so many points if you have a yes or a no answer, and then you add up at the bottom what, you, what your score is. Well, the research shows that for a, for a little boy who has a score that's over six, the odds of them becoming a substance abuser during their lifetime increase by 4,600%. It's a staggering number. And I can tell you, certainly having been in the DA's office for a long time, most of the kids that I worked with started at about a 12. So it's not very hard to get to that six. And trauma was not always, and it was interesting with these panelists. You know, we think, I'm sure as you think about trauma, we're thinking some of the really horrific, they've been sexually abused, they watched a parent be murdered, something like that. It wasn't those kind of traumas. It was often things that maybe wouldn't have seemed too traumatic to us. And it was often the kind of trauma that probably if we took a poll here tomorrow, a lot of these kids have experienced. It was things like a very bad divorce, a lot of hostility in the house that had followed that divorce. It was a very bad breakup with a boyfriend, girlfriend, significant other that we might have looked at as parents and said, they're 14. Let's just move on, that won't matter so much. It was sometimes things that couldn't have been prevented. A parent dropped dead of a heart attack. It was very often a sibling who had a physical or emotional illness that had really sort of misdirected all of the resources of the family. I'll tell you one thing that is, a, as the district attorney, one of the people I always feel saddest for when we have something that happens to a child are the siblings in that family because they lose their sibling and they lose their parents, at least for some period of time. But there were many, many people in this survey who had, had a brother or sister who suffered from leukemia. Maybe they recovered, maybe they didn't, but for that period of time, the focus, and it has to be, the focus of the family was on that sick child. And they had really been sort of left on their own about that. And that really begs a question, it's a community question, do you have in place enough community-based safety nets for those children. And think about when something happens in the community. You know, we all have the brush, we have the, the candles and the flowers. If it's a family, you have, you know, the bridge, the care bridge to get meals and do all of those things. But what happens to the kids in those families? Who's looking out for those kids? And how long is that service being provided? I don't think there's nearly enough of that 
It's one of the things that we have focused an enormous amount of our resources on. You know, you should, like children, you should never have a favorite program. But I have to say, probably my favorite of all the programs we've developed is our Project Care, which was born of an incident where a seven-year-old little girl had gone with her mother who was struggling with addiction to live with the maternal grandparents. The mother was the only child in that family. The family has unlimited wealth. Resources of any kind are not a problem. Grandparents had struggled for years to help their daughter get clean. They'd been unsuccessful. They were worried about their granddaughter. When the daughter asked to come home, they were more than happy to bring the daughter and the granddaughter home. They'd been there a couple of weeks. The granddaughter was coloring on the living room floor. Mother went into the bathroom. A little bit of time went by. Daughter, granddaughter got nervous, went and knocked on the bathroom door. No answer. Knocked a few more times, went and got Nana came back and everybody knows where this is going. Ultimately, they made the 911 call, they took down the door. Mother was still alive, but she'd overdosed in the bathroom. They brought her out into the hallway, full 911 response, mother was taken off the ambulance. She did not survive. Awful on so many levels, but the piece that more than anything else broke my heart was the next morning, the little girl went to school with no one knowing what had happened. And understandable in some ways, born probably of the grandmother's heart was probably broken, not anxious to go down to the school and tell the story. What I've heard a thousand times over the years in the district attorney's office, kids don't really know what's going on. If you've raised a kid, you know their radar on feet. They know everything. Right. It's better for the kids to be in a routine. We've all been seven-year-olds. Many of us have raised seven-year-olds. Think about what it's like to be in that classroom the next day. First of all, probably exhausted, terrified, didn't know these grandparents that well. She didn't get up off the floor to go to the door because she hadn't seen that movie before. So what kind of drug use, normalized, normalization of drug use had she seen before? There's a genetic predisposition. She's lost her mother under the best of circumstances of trauma at the age of seven. So I look at that and I think, as a mother, as a prosecutor, can we really be surprised if six years from now we see that child in the criminal justice system, either because she's been victimized, she's gotten herself in trouble? And so as a result, I approached the real heroes of this story, some of the mental health organizations in our county, they like to tease me about this because I went and I said, I'm going to tell you this story, and I told them the story, and I said, I have no money, but we can do better than this. And they did do better than that. We now have a program where our first responders, when they see a child, or they know a child is going to be impacted. In addition to making that call to DCF, who have been wonderful partners with us, to make the 51A filing, they call one of these mental health providers. Within 24 hours, they have put together a plan for mental health services that they will connect the family to. And if the family is willing, they will serve as that liaison to the school, the daycare, the camp, whoever needs to know about that. We've activated that program over 60 times. We've served over 100 children. We've partnered with the UMass School of Social Work to research what the outcome is, but you know the outcome's gonna be better. You know that. The blankets that folks have made go to Project Linus, which is our first responders, because again, the research shows that the best thing they can give a child in that moment is a blanket, better than a teddy bear or anything else. They can wrap themselves in it, they can pull it over their head if they don't want to look at you. They can do all kinds of things. That's a community response to trauma. And then thirdly, the other commonality I wanted to talk quickly about is the access to prescription opioids. Many, many of the folks that we spoke to followed that path that you've heard. I broke my wrist, I had my wisdom teeth out, I got a prescription, and I really, really liked that prescription, and it led me down this path. And for parents, that really means being good consumers, good advocates for your kids. It means asking, is there an alternative to this? I have a daughter who just graduated from college. Over the holiday break, lots of her friends had their wisdom teeth out. 
to a person, these healthy 21-year-old people who had their wisdom teeth out had an opioid prescription. Right? Now, they, first of all, they had them, they took them. If they didn't finish them, where did the rest of them go? Probably sitting somewhere in a medicine cabinet or being shared. It really is important to be asking, you know, we're making progress in the medical community. There are options. You need to be talking about that, figuring out what to be doing with those. And then remember that the vast majority of misused drugs, 70% of them, are coming out of someone's medicine cabinet. So look in your own house. You know, we have a tendency as Americans, we get that prescription, the condition goes away. Well, I'm going to hang on to them just in case I go on vacation and I get a twinge. It goes in the back of the medicine cabinet. We provided the police departments with disposal boxes 24-7. You take them down, no questions asked. Get rid of them, no one else can, can do that. Um, so getting that out of there is critical. It also avoids the kids who may be coming to your house. You know, it's pretty easy for somebody to walk into your medicine cabinet. They don't take the whole bottle. They take a few out of the bottle, and they walk out. No one is checking those prescriptions, especially if they're things that you're not using. So the simplest community thing you can do is clean out your medicine cabinets. Get rid of what's there. Get rid of the box, and it is always a shoe box, of prescriptions that are there from Nana or Grandpa that end up in the linen closet, right? The police department will tell you, we go to lots of houses, that box, that shoe box full of medication is in the linen closet. Just get rid of it. It's one piece that you can do very simply at no cost that will greatly cut down what's out there on the street. You know, I really think that the best thing we can do in raising community awareness is to be very open and very honest about what we're dealing with. You know, if there was an easy answer to this epidemic, we wouldn't be seeing 2,000 people in Massachusetts dying from it. There is no simple answer to this. But there's progress that's made, and the key piece is, yes, recovery is possible. There are people who are living recovery. It is a very difficult road. And the reality is there are more tragedies than there are successful recovery. So the best way to avoid that is not to have people start. To be doing that prevention as young as possible. To educate our kids. You know, there's a campaign right now, Mom, you protected me from so many things. Will you protect me from this? That is a big piece of our community awareness. The availability of Narcan that we brought to the schools has obviously had an impact on that reduction. And make no doubt about it, we're going to be fighting this for some period of time, despite the progress that we are making. But the amazing thing is in Middlesex County, we are doing this together. We are doing this as a united front, as you're doing in the community with the task force. And your presence here makes that goal much more attainable. It's my hope that with, for every one of you who are here tonight, you take this information, share it with five more people. Think about it. Your kids are growing up together. Think about having those rules, the conversations, the pieces of information that you as a community are going to stand for and communicate to your kids. So thank you for being here tonight. I welcome your participation in all this. And again, thank you to the coalition. Thank you so much, Marion. Um, we just wanted to um, say a few words about the folks who've been making blankets all month. Um, Julianne, our outreach coordinator, has partnered with our local churches, including Old South and First Congregational Church, um, to um, get people making blankets for Project Linus um, to help use them in the way that um, Marion talked about. So I just want to invite up um, Hillary, Carol, and Paige from Old South Methodist Church, and Jen Hillary from our board. I'm not sure where Jen is. Um, if you could stand by the blankets and we'll ask Marianne to, to come down. We just want to take a quick pick with the blankets. And I just want to say one word. Um, Jen Hillary, who's on our board and a former assistant district attorney, um, received a blanket um, from one of her close family members in Vermont, where she's from, in rural Vermont. And the family friend that, that quilted the beautiful green blanket next to Marianne um, was actually made by a mom who lost her child to overdose. So um, we have many local blankets and then also the beautiful blanket that made its way from Vermont. Uh, so 55 blankets were made this month. So thank you so much to all of our folks at our local churches and for all the work they did uh, to get these ready for kids.
as Marion talked about, um, overdoses are not going away. We are seeing some progress in uh, changes in reduction of fatal overdoses. Our local police have responded to 20 opioid-involved overdoses since January of this year. Um, an additional 120 overdoses were responded to in five of our nearby communities. So these blankets will be put to good use. Um, they will get a Project Minus um, tag sewn in to let the children know that these are homemade blankets made for them and to provide a little sense of comfort. So next I want to introduce our keynote speaker. Again, thank you to our churches. Um, our keynote speaker is Dr. Ruth Cote. She's a board certified in family and addiction medicine, practicing at Valley Medical Group in Greenfield, Massachusetts. Um, so she traveled quite a way to get to us. Um, she has an amazing resume, and she told me that I was not allowed to share all of it because she wanted to get us to speak in. So I'm going to invite her to come up, and I will get her slides up for her. So when's Mary Ryan running for higher office? Anybody wondering that question? Ready for that? Uh, that was awesome. A little more Healy Mary Ryan ticket up at the top, ready for a lot of change to uh, happen in Massachusetts. So she actually stole most of my talk away. I could literally like. I could talk for five minutes because she basically covered it. You know how you're supposed to learn things twice, so I guess some of you are going to get some of this twice. Um, and I'm going to talk fast because it's almost eight, and you guys, I mean, first of all, people should stand up, like literally, whoop, up on your feet. Stand up, let's move our bodies a little bit because we're all sitting too much all the time. During this talk, I want to see some downward dogs, some stretches. You guys need to move your body. I don't care how much you need to walk around the building. This slide deck is available to anybody who wants it. You can take it um, from me, and uh, Erica has it. And anybody can take these slides. You don't credit me. I don't care. Just give the talk anywhere you want to. I'm going to show you a slide uh, at the end of a place where you can get everything. So we're going to dive in on the brain. We're going to talk about the physiology and what happens to the brain when you develop a substance use disorder. So uh, this is a brand new slide. I actually put together my first new slide deck of the season for you guys uh, this past weekend. If anybody read the National Geographic? Um, story on addiction. It was really good and the video was really good and it was actually really very accurate and it really understandable. But it's the reward circuit of the brain that gets broken with addiction. It is the part of the brain that tells you to survive. The ventral tegmental area, the prefrontal cortex, and the nucleus accumbens. Here it's a complicated story they tell um, of how the brain gets hijacked, but it's again extremely accurate. And this part of the brain tells you every day to get out of bed and find food and find water and find a mate because your entire purpose on this planet is to survive long enough to spread your genetic material forward. That is your purpose. Now, most of us don't get out of the bed in the day and think that way, right? But that is for 200,000 years what you're supposed to do. And your ancestors were good at this, right? They were good because we exist. So it's about surviving long enough to spread your genetic material forward. This reward circuit of the brain um, has those benefits. It happens to be the part of the brain that is impacted with all addiction. And if you could pick up the disease of addiction and move it anywhere else in the brain, right? You lost your, your higher level of hearing or you lost your peripheral vision, addiction would be a really easy disease to treat. But instead, the part of the brain that tells you to live or die is the part impacted by addiction which is why it's such a hard disease to manage. So, uh, we spent time today not focusing on serotonin, which governs mood. We're gonna focus on dopamine, because that's the neurotransmitter that is the final push with all of the reward circuit. It gives you the strong sense of euphoria and holy smokes, that was awesome what I just did. I need to repeat that behavior. It has with it associated fine motor skills. So one of the things that helps people in the acute phase of addiction is actually doing something with their hands. Um, and there's two behaviors associated with dopamine in the brain. One is compulsivity or compulsiveness, and the other one is perseveration. And your ancestors were absolutely fabulous with perseveration and compulsivity. They went to bed, last thing they thought of is, how am I going to find food and water enough to support my family? They woke up in the morning, it's absolutely the first thing they thought of. And those were awesome behaviors when it came to survival. But those two behaviors, when it comes to addiction, are a big pain in the butt. And for those of us that work with people struggling with a substance use disorder all day long, sometimes I look at them and I'm like, man, I want to dope slap you. I know I can't smack you. But I say that to them. I'm like, 
Don't be slapped, right? Because your behaviors of the perseveration, the compulsivity, have brought you back to me yet again, deeply involved in something that is a hot mess. So who's in the room in the medical field? Do I have nurses, doctors, PAs, right? So again, those of us who've worked in the ERs, we see them again and again and again and again, right? Right? Stop for a minute, take a breath, and remind yourself. Compulsivity, perseveration, part of the definition of it all. So I make an argument in this talk that at a baseline, we sit at a, some level of dopamine in our brain. And on average in this room, most of us may be sitting at about 100 units of dopamine. And some of us are glass half full, happy people, golden retrievers of the world, and our dopamine level's like on 105. Who's that in this room? I have gold retrievers in the room? I got a gold retriever back there at the camera, awesome. A lot of us look like this, though. Our dopamine baseline levels are sitting at 85. These people come to the doctor a lot, right? My day was spent with dopamine levels that are low in my primary care office. Um, and we have, I have one of these people in my family, and it is what it is, right? There are people who feel less good um, than others. So what happens, though, is if your baseline dopamine level is 100 and you find that perfect food, you kill the stag, you know you can support your family for another four or five days, 500 years ago, living in eastern Massachusetts. You get a spike in dopamine, right? Your dopamine goes to 150, it says good behavior, continue that behavior, that will keep you alive, and then it goes back to 100. You have sex, it's consensual, you have an orgasm, your dopamine spikes to 200, and then it goes back to normal. Then this is the way your brain works to keep you going with behaviors consistent with survival. You use a drug like cocaine and your dopamine goes to 350. You use a drug like a prescription opiate or heroin or fentanyl these days and your dopamine will spike between 500 and 900. And you use a drug like crystal methamphetamine and your um, dopamine will spike to about 1300. So what's amazing is that more of us don't wake up every day and take a hit of meth because that sounds awesome, right? That's like eight times orgasm, right? That's good, that's a good equation. Okay, so let's talk about exactly how it works. A couple fast drugs, cocaine. There's three things that impact the dopamine in the brain. How much dopamine is produced, how many dopamine receptors are sitting on the other side of the uh, synaptic cleft receiving the information, and how many little vacuums, these little transporters, are sucking dopamine out of this active part of the brain. The way cocaine works is it does one simple thing. It turns off the vacuum. When the vacuums are turned off, there's nothing sucking out the dopamine. So that's how you get to a dopamine level of 350. Opiates are more complicated because they go through the mu opiate receptor, they hit the GABA receptor, it's a negative feedback loop, but at the end of the day, opiates pump out more dopamine. So the problem is that when the brain is seeing dopamine levels of 150 or 200, that's normal for 200,000 years. The time that we have been in this human form on this planet Having a dopamine level of 150 or 200 is the way it's supposed to be. But when the brain sees 350, 500, 900, it freaks out and it says, holy smokes, there's something going wrong here. I need to turn down the volume. I need to erase 80% of my dopamine receptors. I'm gonna stop making dopamine. I'm gonna turn on every vacuum in sight. So people who develop an addiction wake up in the morning and their new set level of dopamine is about 40 or 40. It is hard to get out of bed. It is hard to have a shower. It's hard to go to work and be nice to your colleagues. You can't call my office and make an appointment without dropping six F-bombs and threatening people. You feel miserable. And the only way you feel normal again is to return to the use of the substance. People no longer chase a high, right? They're trying to prevent getting sick with a bad opiate withdrawal, but they, every day, are desperate to get their dopamine back to 85, right? They're not looking for golden retriever days. They're looking for some semblance of normalcy because their brain is broken. Okay, you guys know the basics of this. So at Winchester Hospital, guaranteed this happened today, not because I'm throwing that lovely hospital under the bus, but because I can say this about every single hospital in our country. This happened this morning, this happened this week. This guy is 68 years old, he lives in North Reading. He's having crushing some sternal chest pain, he looks a little gray, he looks at his wife and he's like, no, it's okay, it's a little indigestion. And his wife's like, holy smokes, I'm calling 911. 
So EMS arrives in that living room and says, holy smokes, this guy looks terrible. And they give him some oxygen, they give him a sublingual aspirin and a beta blocker, and they give him some nitroglycerin, they put in a big bore IV into his arm, and they transmit that EKG from that living room to Winchester, and Winchester says, oh my God, do not bring him here. Too sick for us. MGH or Leahy, take your pick, but truck him right past us, right? He shows up in the Mass General and he has a quintuple bypass, right? This guy's having a massive interior wall MI and he's going to be dead in an hour. He has that bypass, survives it, does great, is in the cardiac care unit for four or five days, goes just to the med surge floor or telly for another week, gets a social work consult because he's going to be depressed because all men post heart attack get depression. He gets to see me, his primary care doctor, and his new cardiologist, gets a social work outpatient therapy visit, goes to cardiac rehab. For 12 weeks. How much money that could cost us? I love the 100,000. I don't know what state you're in. 500,000. Okay, there. That's a little closer. So we send them to the Mass General, my friends, right? It's a part of the partner system. So probably a quarter million dollars. A lot of money. His next door neighbor is the mom of that seven year old that the district attorney told us about. Mom's kicking in the door. Mom has Narcan on her when she breaks in the door and finds her daughter blue on the ground. She calls 911 first, administers one dose of Narcan. The daughter doesn't revive. EMS police in Reading arrive. They have to use four vials of Narcan before she comes to, and they actually bring her to Winchester Hospital where she survives. What's offered to her at Winchester Hospital here? Somebody says she's sent home. Give me a best scenario, because I have to say, Reddit is doing everything right. I sat here and heard, and I nodded my head and thought, wow, they're doing that and that and that and that. You guys are doing an awesome job. Is chance the ER is doing a good job, too? What are they doing? Referrals, detox admissions. Okay, so that is a pretty awesome ER if that can happen, that maybe a psychiatrist referral. I don't know how many people have open psych appointments. It's pretty hard in Massachusetts, but maybe they get into a referral for detox, and there's an open spot somewhere that actually gets them into stable treatment. That would be great. What else? If they stick, right? She has acute diarrhea and she's vomiting and her dopamine level's 45 and you actually just ruined her awesome high for her. She felt pretty good. She's likely to launch out the door. That's possible. But sometimes it just takes one right person in that moment to change her outcome. Yep. You could, if somebody really good right there can choose to section 12 for mental health reasons or section 35 for, for substance abuse reasons, that's right. So some possibly good things could happen in the ER, but I will make an argument that most of the time in most ERs in Massachusetts and in this country, not much is offered to her. Maybe a brochure with, here's some numbers, good luck to you if you buy them. Or possibly they're not even seeing me, right. So let me tell you more about my 68-year-old guy from North Reading, okay? 68 years old, both of his parents had heart attacks in their late 50s. Actually, his dad died in his late 50s of a massive MI. He smokes a pack and a half a day. He kicks back a 12-pack of beer every day. He goes to McDonald's four times a week. Doesn't exercise. He actually doesn't come see me, his primary care doctor. And I know this because I saw him three years ago and told him he had high blood pressure and his sugar was a little bit high and he never filled the scripts. Does this guy have addiction? What's he addicted to? Sugar? Probably alcohol? Nicotine? Yep, not addicted to exercise. Definitely not addicted to coming to the doctor, right? But did anybody wag their finger at him when he was in the living room of his house with a massive MI that he, by the way, 100% created? He did, right? 68-year-old people, every now and then you get some bad luck. But in general, this gentleman created this disease. Right? He did. There's no way around that. But did anybody wave their finger and say, you know what, I'm actually not going to provide you care today. I'm actually going to offer you not very much, because I judge you for how you got into this hot mess. And because of that, I'm going to punish you by giving you just about nothing and see how you do. Right? Instead, we didn't do that. We gave everything possible in this fine country with the best possible medical care in the world and spent a quarter million dollars on a 68-year-old man who also made some tricky choices in his life. Right? And what bothers me the most about addiction is the disparity of care. That happens across the board. It actually outrages me. And the reason I do this work and the reason I'm not at home with my kids right now is I am so pissed off about this disparity. I am ticked off that I learned nothing about this in medical school. I learned nothing about this in residency. 
And I figured it out a hell of a lot later when I began seeing people walk into my office who needed help and there was nobody there to do the work. So the next time you're at your primary care office, I want you to ask that person, what are you doing to help people with addiction? How do you figure out who's struggling with alcohol and what treatment are you giving them? Because we need to push from the ground up other people to do this work. The notion that our superintendent of this school and the police chief wrote a letter to healthcare providers and said, hey, by the way, I actually know that you actually don't know much about this and actually you're probably not paying much attention, but we just wanted to let you know that kids are vaping like crazy these days and you may be getting referrals for this thing called Espert, which by the way, you probably know nothing about because nobody ever bothered to teach it to you. Like that is insane and very impressive, by the way, that that happened that direction, but it should never happen. It outrageous. So I give these talks at Ground Rounds, and there's nothing that makes me more mad than getting a group of doctors. And I know they don't want the addicts in their way. I know how they are. So fight. Fight for that 23-year-old woman, because that guy deserved that care, but so did she. You know, you know what I can do with a quarter million dollars to help somebody with addiction? I actually can help them a lot. Give me some money. Okay, let's, let's go back to dopamine in the brain. These are pet scans. This is just to tell you I didn't make up the dopamine story. So that middle column, those are healthy brains. All that orange stuff is dopamine. That far column to the, um, to the right, those are brains of people struggling with addiction. The top one's cocaine, the next one down is meth, third one down is alcohol, and the final one down is somebody with heroin. I want you guys to look at alcohol. Do you see how it has a little orange in it? The wheels come off the alcohol bus late in the game. Alcohol is one of the most damaging drugs in our society, right? For those of us who work in the jails, who work in the district attorney's office, those of us who have family members who struggle with addiction to alcohol, it is a very damaging drug. It is completely legal. It's really easy to walk into a liquor store as an alcoholic and buy whatever the hell you want and continue your way down that. But people don't fall apart really fast. They're functional alcoholics, right? They go to work, their wife's still not too pissed off at them, and then they get their second OUI, they're in jail, they lose their license, it takes a while. So this has been covered by our great district attorney who knew it already, but there's three things that are gonna put you at risk for developing addiction. The first one is genetics. The second one is early exposure while the brain is developing, and the third one is a history of trauma. Having poor mental health does not mean you become somebody who struggles with addiction. Having poor mental health can be a subcomponent of those other things that often is actually genetic. It can come from um, a history of, of trauma. And people who have early use, they often will say, I started drinking when I was 13 because it was the only time I didn't feel anxious. It's what made me feel like I could fit in with my peers. So the poor mental health becomes a subcomponent of those other things and they can feed into each other. The genetics of addiction are some of the strongest genetics that we've ever seen. There's very few diseases that have this much genetic linking. Some of the mental health disorders do. ADHD has a lot of genetics associated with it. But if you have a parent or a grandparent who struggles with addiction, you have about a 50% chance of developing an addiction yourself. So who needs to hear that piece of information from you? Your kids need to know that piece of information. Well, so the question was, does it skip a generation? It skips a generation, not genetically, but because sometimes what happens is people like me who may have grown up with an addicted parent says, holy smokes, this is so dreadful, I will never drink. And you become somebody who walks away from alcohol. But your kids, it's still within their genetic tree. Right? They had a grandparent who was, a, who was struggling with addiction, they need to know that. So the conversation you have with your kids, you don't need to get into the gory details, but you need to talk to your kids. And you need to say, we are at very high risk of the disease of addiction in our family. And you don't get to control that. You get what you get with your genetics, right? They have no choice, but they need to at least know. Because what they do with the next thing by making good decisions actually almost entirely erases the genetics. Hello, when do you ever get to erase the genetics? But with addiction, you do, right? So that's what our kids need to hear. Because if you delay your use of when you are exposed to an addictive substance, if you delay your use to age 21, 22, or 23, the genetic impact almost entirely disappears. Because all addiction is a developmental pediatric disease. And when you add somebody who struggles with addiction, how old are you when you started? Did you start with alcohol, marijuana, or nicotine? The answer is universally, I was. Always it is. I was 12, 13, 14. 
But sometimes, depending on who you're asking, so I, I'm the medical director of a jail, and in that group, 120 men, I'm like, who started when they were 12? Every hand was up at 12, right? And I'm like, 11, 10, 9, 8? I, you know, then I start to feel sick, right? Seven, six. I have hands in the air at six years old with their first use of alcohol, marijuana, or tobacco. Those are some of the sickest people in our community, right? 85% of people incarcerated in county jail in Massachusetts are there for substance use disorder. And they, they started really young. So if you are somebody at high risk of addiction based on your genetics and you delay your use to any of the addictive substance till after 21, 22, or 23, the genetics almost entirely disappear. So if you are sitting here thinking, holy smokes, my kids are at risk, you need to have this conversation with them. This really should be taught in the schools. This should be taught in the health class. Every parent should know this coming to like open house or athletic night. This is very reasonable stuff. If I were running an insurance company, I wouldn't just be paying you because you had your cholesterol checked, right? Like I have to say, that's not gonna have big impact on long-term outcomes. But paying you to actually tell your kids the truth about your genetic history of addiction, getting all your liquor locked up in your house and getting every pill out of your house, it's probably the thing I'd be paying you for, right? But this stuff, addiction, it's expensive for insurance companies. So if you are a 15-year-old kid and you start drinking, and drinking here is defined as two alcoholic beverages a week, you're 15 years old and you start drinking, 40% of those kids go on to be alcoholics. If you wait till the age of 21, 7% to go on to be alcoholics, which is well lower than the 13% of those of us who struggle with an alcohol use disorder. So delaying use is the critical message our kids need to hear from us. Having said that, our kids are actually, as a generation, making the best decision about substances that we have ever seen, as long as the data has been collected, ever. So I want to pause, and when I give this talk to kids, which I'm doing tomorrow morning, I actually pause and say, this room, a bunch of adolescents are making the best decisions we've ever seen. They're not smoking, they're drinking very little, they're actually not using a lot of opiates, they're making awesome decisions, with the exception of one area, which we're gonna spend time on. So, if you ask a 15 year old, are you smoking cigarettes? They're like, of course I'm not smoking cigarettes, they're horrible, they're disgusting, they're gonna kill me. And you're like, yeah, you're right, that's so right, right? But if you talk to them about marijuana, what do they tell you? Well, they're smoking it. They say it's not so bad. Specifically, what might they say about marijuana? It's legal. It's legal. I can grow 12 plants at my house. What else? It's not addictive. What else? Yeah, it's easy to eat. It comes in a Kit Kat bar. I'm a better driver when I'm high on weed. It's better than alcohol. Universally, you hear that. It's natural, it's organic, it grows in the ground, it's better than what the pharmaceutical industry is doing. So the kids have their own knowledge set about marijuana, and I can tell you, they think it's all good, right? They have very little they think is bad. So we're gonna spend time on marijuana because I actually think it's the substance that is our biggest risk in the next 10 to 15 to 20 years. So there's three things that happen in this high school every day that are absolutely <coughs> critical um, for developing a healthy brain. The first one is called synaptic refinement. So your brain has billions of connections between the points of the brain. And that is way too many. Between the ages of 12 and 24, you need to prune back all of these little synaptic connections and only keep the ones that are helpful to you and get rid of the ones that are not. This is what creates a healthy brain. And synaptic refinement is only happening between the ages of 12 and 24. There are points during adolescence where you are losing 30,000 synaptic connections a minute. This has to happen, and you sure as heck hope that while that 30,000 is being lost a minute, that they're not smoking weed and playing a video game in your basement. You'd like them to be doing something positive while that is getting a crude back. So the second thing that happens is something called myelination, which is when you insulate um, healthy pathways in the brain that are gonna be much more efficient. So, our kids' brains are normal, and they're amazing, and they're wonderful, and man, they can be really hard to parent sometimes, right? Anybody else have teenagers that sometimes you're like, oh my God, what is going on here, right? Because these kids push the envelope. That is the nature of this brain. This brain is trying to figure out what do I need to keep and what do I need to get rid of. They're very sensation-seeking, 
They're very risk-taking. They're very think later, act first, less than optimal planning. Um, emotions are incredibly intensely felt. The spectrum of emotions is incredibly wide. I have a 15-year-old daughter. She is happy and tells me she loves me, and 15 seconds later, she is screaming at me and weeping, right? And I'm thinking to myself, holy smokes, that just happened in 15 seconds. I haven't even opened my mouth. I've done nothing. Like, what is up with this girl? But I know in my own head, it's this. This is a normal brain that is trying to figure out what is going on, right? So we're all parenting these kids. Or in our case of our, you know, our, our school resource officer, he is serving a role of helping to uh, be a, a loving, guiding adult in these kids' lives. There's no time in your life where you are more influenced by your peers than you are when you're an adolescent, never. Your adolescence is about figuring out who your herd is. When you were eight years old and some kid told you to do something stupid on the playground, you were like, no, I'm gonna go tell the teacher. And when you were 27 years old and some friend of yours said, let's go do something stupid, you're like, dude, I'm 27 years old, that's stupid, I'm not gonna do it. But when you were 15 and 16 and 18, you're like, I'm in. That sounds awesome. I'm, I, you know, I am finding my herd and I will follow you wherever you go. So your, your kids' peers, there's never a time that you hope they choose well and where they, where they will be influenced so much. Okay, three things I said happened, synaptic refinement, myelination. The final one is laying down of receptors. The final receptors of the dopamine receptors get laid down in the brain. Think about that. That is why all addiction starts in adolescence, because it's dopamine that gets disrupted and the dopamine receptors get laid down in the final cortex of the brain. The second receptor that gets laid down is something called anandamide. Anandamide is the naturally occurring endocannabinoid in your brain. It looks exactly like THC, which is the psychoactive component of marijuana. So I have this receptor that has been in my brain for 200,000 years, and I introduce into my brain a drug that confuses this receptor in my brain. We think this receptor has to do with what gets clipped and what gets thrown away, right? We, we don't know much about this receptor. It was discovered not that long ago, within the last 20 years. And the problem is that THC is like a sledgehammer in terms of how it makes decisions, as opposed to a fine scalpel, which is the naturally occurring endocannabinoid. So I'm gonna say the very strong words to you that I actually don't care what you do at the age of 38 with marijuana in your own house. I don't think it's probably much worse than alcohol. I don't want you on my roads. I don't want you changing the lug nuts on my tire. I don't want you babysitting my kids, right? But what you do in your own house with marijuana after a certain age, I don't care about. I care about the developing brain. And when I am talking to teenagers about this who are full of fire about how awesome marijuana is. I'm like, look guys, while your brain is developing, this is a neurotoxic drug. This has a very big impact on how your brain develops, and we're gonna spend the next few slides talking exactly what it looks like. So people who are using marijuana as adolescents have an impact on attention, verbal learning, memory, processing speed, and that continues even when they're not actively high. When you look at people starting marijuana using between the ages of 14 and 21. There's, I'm gonna do my two extremes to make the point. There's the category of people who had zero use of marijuana between the ages of 14 and 21, which is my light gray line. And there are people who've used marijuana more than 400 times in that seven year span. Now 400 times of marijuana use in seven years, that's not much use, right? That's using once a week, once a couple times a week. I'm not asking for seven times a day. It doesn't take much to get to 400 uses in seven years, okay? But look at that. The percent of kids who, who graduated from college by age 25 with zero use was 36%. The percent of kids who graduated who had 400 plus or more, 2%. Unemployment rate, 52% unemployment rate for people with 400 uses or more in comparison to 21% unemployment by age 25. Dependent on welfare in their early 20s, 57%. This is New Zealand and Australian data. Their welfare system is a little bit different than ours, but that is incredibly alarming data, right? That for me is a kid who has failed to launch, right? I love my three kids. I want them to grow up and get out of my house. 
I do. I love them, but my job is to nurture them enough to say bye bye bye. I don't want them living with me when they're 23 or 24. They've got to leave and pay taxes and walk their own dog and do their own thing. So um, the data, again, New Zealand and Australia was that by age 35, there was at least an eight point drop in IQ for people who started using marijuana during adolescence. And as District Attorney Ryan indicated, the problem is with all of the data I just showed you is it's based on the old marijuana. It's based on marijuana whose percent THC was between 1% and 3%. We have no data on today's THC and what it does to the developing brain. And today's marijuana, every field grown plant out there is sitting between 9% and 6% THC. That's the stuff that's just growing in somebody's patio pot or out in, in, the, in the fields where I live. Um, so the stuff is incredibly potent. And then it comes in all these forms that our kids all know. Our kids know exactly what, sh you know, shatter and bud and earwax is. And this stuff is sitting between 70 and 90% THC. This is what is available at my medical marijuana store, and it will be available at a recreational marijuana store near you in July of 2018. Not, did you guys vote against it in Reading? I love you guys. Awesome work, awesome work. But there will be a town near you where there'll be a dispensary. This will be coming to you. Um, you guys know this, there are a thousand different ways that you can now uh, get marijuana into your body. You can smoke it, you can vape it, you can eat it, you can drink it, it's an ice cream, it's a beer, it's a spaghetti sauce, you name it, and you can have it. And our kids know this. What you know about marijuana may not feel like a lot. I can tell you, your kids know a ton about marijuana because it's this thing called Google. And Google is very pro-marijuana. Not the company, I don't think, but if you search it, boy, the first 900 pages are all pretty positive. So um, this is the stuff the kids love. Like when I show this slide in a, in a room with a thousand adolescents, they laugh and they nudge each other and I can't even quiet down the room. They love this slide, it excites them, right? They think it's funny. And this is intended to hook as many adolescents as possible. Right? This is sugar plus chocolate plus flat, um, fat plus wheat. Right? This is not intended for your 90-year-old grandmother who has cancer and can't stop vomiting. Right? She's not eating a pot tart. Right? That's not how she's managing her symptoms. This is intended to hook as many young people as possible. And unless the Cannabis Commission in the state of Massachusetts said we're going to put a limit on the amount of THC available and there will be no sugar, fat-filled edibles available for dispensing in the state, I don't see that happening. I wish that would happen. Maybe it will. Maybe it will surprise me. But this is what the other dispensaries look like. This is from Colorado. Yes. This is not in Massachusetts. Has anybody been to a medical marijuana dispensary? I have. I've toured them. Yeah, they have edibles, but they're not like this. They had a chocolate bar, like some like 70% dark chocolate. You ate one square for it was it was it was very it was an adult product, right? That's how I would say when I walked into my medical marijuana. It was intended for adults with medical problems. This is not. This is intended to hook kids. I'm gonna skip because I'm worried about time. Okay, let's talk about alcohol because I already told you that um, I worry about alcohol in our society. So. One third of us in this country drink at zero, nothing at all. One third of us drink very lightly. A couple drinks a month, a drink a week, not very much. And the final one third of us drink all the rest of the alcohol sold in the country. And in fact, the final 10% of us drink on average nine to 10 drinks every single day. I have patients I take care of that drink 24 to 50 drinks a day. But 10% of Americans drink between nine and 10 drinks every single day. 13% of us, the latest data show in this country, and it's just data just came out a month ago, are struggling with an alcohol use disorder. That's a huge number. It has become very normalized and it's very easy to add up to nine or 10 drinks because what counts as a drink? A beer is a beer. A 12 ounce beer is considered a beer, but most of us drink a lot of craft beers, right? And I don't know, my IPA is actually 9% alcohol. That's actually two beverages, actually, when you do the math. A glass of wine is five ounces, okay? So when I ask my women, what are you drinking? Or what's your relationship with alcohol? Women will say to me, you know, I have a couple glasses at night. And I'm like, oh, you're drinking wine? And they say, mm-hmm. And I say, what goes in a glass? And they say, you know, I drink a glass. Because we are drinking giant goblets of wine these days, right? 
mason jars on a stem, and you come home and you love, 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 love. And I look at my women in my office, and I say, I need you to measure five ounces into your glass. And I need you to acknowledge that's one glass of wine. And if you happen to be drinking 15 or 20 ounces, you need to just acknowledge, I just had four glasses of wine while I made dinner tonight. Okay, you just need to acknowledge that. There's no judgment from me. But you need to acknowledge how much you're drinking. And you need to stop and ask yourself, why am I drinking that much? Because, as Mary and Ryan said, more of us are turning to alcohol to self-medicate. Right? And I don't, I'm going I'm to not ignore the men in the room. I'm going to talk to the women in the room. A lot of us got up at 5 this morning, and I did a couple loads of laundry, and I walked the dog, and I did last night's breakfast dishes, and I yelled at my kids a tiny bit, and I packed a bag, and I did some work, and this is all before 6.30 in the morning, right? And then I went off to work, and I'm right now on my 13th hour of work, because I started seeing patients at 7.15. So our days look like this, right? This is the way women's lives are. I don't know who's going to go home and vacuum the rug and pack a lunch, but women's lives are really busy. I don't know how often you're sitting down on the couch eating bonbons. I don't see it happening very often. But more often than we have ever seen, there's been a transition to women consuming vast quantities of alcohol. We have never seen this in the history of the world, right? Men drink alcohol. Men became alcoholics. But in the last 15 years, it has shifted. It's not quite one to one yet. We're not quite that bad. But the ratio of alcoholism used to be nine to one, male to female, it's now six to three. I have 24 year old women in my detox that I run who are in active withdrawal from alcohol. They're picking imaginary bugs off their skin. They're 24 years old. I've never seen anything like this. It's a public health crisis. And some of it is this, it's marketed to women, right? Mommy's juice, mommy's time out, moms need this to survive, right? I go to places like Wellesley, I'm not throwing Wellesley under the bus. My Wellesley, I went to Wellesley, I have a Wellesley classmate here. But when I gave this talk at Wellesley, I can tell you there's a lot of moms in the western suburbs who are starting drinking about three in the afternoon. Right? They go to yoga class, I think they're pretty buzzed. And then they have another half bottle of wine while they make dinner. It is a problem. What was said about modeling for your kids is absolutely critical. You think they don't want you walk home after a crappy day at work and glug, glug, glug. That's the model. All the time you do that. And instead, if you walked in the door and said, man, I've had a terrible day. I need to go for a walk. Anybody want to go for a walk with me? I hate my job. I think I really want to quit. But instead, I'm going to go sit down with my smartphone. I'm going to hit my mindfulness meditation, John Kabat-Zinn, 10 minute mindfulness meditation work. That's what I'm going to go do in the living room. Anybody want to join me on that? Going to this Jams for Jake conference or, or uh, um, music, music event with your kids and being, having it be a sober event where nobody's drinking, your kids actually have almost never been to an adult event where there was not alcohol. Just pause for me on that. How often do they go to an alcohol-free adult event? Not very often. You've got to model some of that stuff, my friends, because they're watching everything you do. And going to that event and saying, you know what, there was a kid once who was loved and was lovely and was a fabulous person in this world, and he got really sick and he died. And we're here to help actually support the fact that actually addiction takes people's lives, but people can get better too. And we want to model that. So I actually think this, this, this music event is a really good time to talk to your kids about the disease of addiction. Okay. I love that she knows this stuff, and I've never seen a DA cover of trauma like she just did, because trauma is critical. One of the things I will say about Reading, the fact that you guys are doing so much mental health work here, is becoming a trauma-informed school, a trauma-informed community, knowing every mental health provider out there who's actually good at doing trauma treatment, because trauma treatment looks very different than typical talk therapy. So let's dive in on the ACE score. And I want to give you the background on it. In 1996, a study came out of San Diego. It was complicated why it was done, but um, it had 50,000 patients in it, and it asked 17,000 people under the age of 18 if something bad happened to them in a very rapid way. 10 questions, yes or no. I'm actually, I'm going to read not the whole thing, I'm going to read some of it though. Did a parent or another adult in the household often or very often swear at you, insult you, put you down, or humiliate you, or act in a way that made you afraid you might be physically hurt? 
Did a parent or another adult in the household often or very often push, grab, slap, or throw something at you, or ever hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured? Were you ever sexually abused? Did you often or very often feel that no one in your family loved you, thought you were important or special, or that your family didn't look out for each other, feel close to each other, or support each other? Did you often or very often feel that you didn't have enough to eat, had to wear dirty clothes, and that you had no one to protect you, or that your parents were too drunk or too high to take you to the doctor if you were sick? Were your parents separated or divorced? Was there somebody in your household with major mental illness? Was there somebody in your household who was incarcerated? Did you grow up in a household where you watched your father or stepfather physically abuse your mom or stepmom? 10 questions, yes or no. I score a one on this, my parents were divorced, otherwise I had a perfect childhood. If you score a six or a higher on the ACE score, you're gonna die 20 years earlier. You're gonna have a much higher risk of having a heart attack. In fact, you're gonna be at much higher risk of every chronic disease out there with the exception of diabetes and strokes. This measure of household dysfunction, neglect, and abuse is a marker of chronic disease, and the CDC has spent tons of money understanding trauma and what it does to the human brain and the human body. Because when you're living in fear 24-7 and your cortisol response and your adrenaline is spiked all the time, it is incredibly bad for your nervous system for the rest of your life. And that is why treating a seven-year-old for trauma as fast as you can for as long as you need to is absolutely important. And that's where resources need to go. Absolutely. Talk about good preventive health care. That's where it needs to go. So the message I say to parents is to talk to your kids. You talk to them early and you talk to them often. You start fourth or fifth grade. You start when they're in kindergarten by saying, oh, you see a pill on the ground, you don't touch a pill on the ground. You come get an adult instantly, right? An iron tablet. Five milligrams of lisinopril will kill a five-year-old, right? So you tell that to a five-year-old. By fifth grade, you should be having a substance use discussion with your kids, right? You should be talking about cigarettes and marijuana and alcohol. If the average age of first start is 12, 13, or 14, well, what is that, guys? That's a sixth, seventh, or eighth grader. Talk to them before the horse is out of the barn. The message you want to say is delay your use as long as possible. While your brain is developing, you're at high risk of developing a substance use disorder. And if you can wait till your brain is nearly fully developed, you won't develop a substance use disorder. How amazing is that? That's the message. Our kids should walk out of high school knowing this stuff, inside and out. Um, I'm gonna skip a tiny bit. I am gonna remar remark what you guys already said. Tobacco use is down across the board with the exception of vaping, and I find vaping to be higher in the western suburbs than I've ever seen it anywhere else. We don't have vaping rates like this in western mass, but vaping rates, I can't speak, I didn't look at Reading's numbers. A high school senior, high school senior last 30 years, high school in general. Ooh, that's a high number. High school in general in the last 30 days using a vaped product is 24%. That is a very big number. So you know what? We should shut down, down those damn vaping stores too. Those things are targeted towards kids. They're like little watermelon, bubblegum, pink flavor. You think a trucker is using that? That's intended for a 13-year-old, right? It's marketed towards them. Smartphones. I'm not going to spend tons of time on this, but man, isn't it hard to parent this I generation? I don't think we have any idea what we're doing, and I think we have no idea what this I generation is gonna turn out like, because our kids are glued to their phones. Now there's some data that suggests that they're so busy being addicted to their darn screen that it's a protective effect about not getting addicted to other things. That's kind of crazy thought, right? <laughs> But it doesn't mean it makes me happy because these kids are so busy staring at their screens and communicating by tap tapping on something that they know have no clue how to actually communicate to a live human being anymore. And they go off to college and they're depressed and they're no longer sleeping and they are falling apart. So all I'm gonna say is that this is a worry for all of us who are parenting. This is a great article in the Atlantic Monthly that just came out this month. If you could, if you guys are gonna, um, you're going to take my slide deck. Erica's going to share it with anybody who wants it. I don't know how exactly she's going to do that. Maybe there's an email list she'll create, create out there. But this is an awesome article to read, and it changed everything at my house. My kids are still not speaking to me, but it's all good. <laughs> okay, so I'm not going to spend tons of time because it's getting late. Um, you guys were doing the work in Middlesex County at the same time we were doing the work in Franklin County, and we saw young people dying. That's what we saw, that young woman in that top left corner the obituary that morning, 
December of 2012, read Ashley Sims, age 21, died of a heroin overdose at home. And I knew her and I knew her family. And for me, it was the beginning of diving in deeply and saying, you know, we have young people dying and we're not managing. There's no doubt in my mind that pills are the original thing that started this. Um, there's no country in the world that prescribes more opiates than the United States of America. Um, we have now well surpassed uh, every other accidental cause of death, including car accidents, gun violence, HIV at the top peak of the epidemic. We have now surpassed all of those numbers in terms of death by opiates. We have 91 Americans dying every single day. And I agree that Massachusetts, I think in the last quarter, may finally be plateauing for the first time ever. And I pray for that, but it just takes one bad batch, guys. One bad batch of fentanyl comes in and that number is gonna shift fast. Um, you guys can, again, look at these slides later, but this just watches overdoses, which are those red areas travel over the years in the last um, 12 years throughout the country. I am gonna spend a minute on this. You know, I think that we spend a lot of time talking about opiate prescribing, and there's no doubt there was way over prescribing of opiates. I was, you know, I've been a doctor for 18 years. I used to work at the South Boston Community Health Center where I prescribed Oxycontin in the 1990s. Hello, that was me as a resident. I had, we were told it was all good, it was all safe, it's no problem. And within six months, we're like, holy smokes, we have a massive problem on our hands because these kids in South here are getting totally hooked on Oxycontin and we all stopped. But it was too late, we created a generation of people really struggling. So we've been at this for a while, it wasn't new. But most of the pills that were coming to New England were coming out of the state of Florida where they had over 600 pill mills. You walk in, cash, no insurance accepted. You don't need any limp, you need no medical history, you got need nothing. You just need to come in with your wad of cash and you will walk out with prescriptions. And we would send tour buses down there to pick them up. And so the federal government said to Florida in 2009, if you do not shut down these pill mills, we will take away all your federal money. You will have no money for education or highways, your airports will get shut down. And Florida said, oh my God, I guess we should do something about our 10 years of pill mills. And so they shut down these pill mills and 34 doctors who were actually drug dealers went to jail. But the problem is we had the entire Eastern seaboard that had a huge population hooked on opiates. And when that pipeline was shut down, what were you left with? Right? The unintended consequence of shutting off pills for people who are struggling with addiction is you're left with heroin, which is a much deadlier disease. Um, so heroin was here, and it was plentiful, it is cheap, um, it is unbelievably pure, and shutting down the volume of heroin coming to this country is no easy task. There's no building of a wall that will shut this down. This stuff is mailed in, it's trucked in, it is Ubered around, it comes by boat, it's not going to be easy to shut off. So when I, and I spend a lot of time training doctors about how to prescribe more safely. I also am a primary care doctor who takes care of people with chronic pain, some of whom are totally stable on their opiates and doing fine. And when the pendulum swings too far and you have doctors all throughout Massachusetts kicking patients out of their practice saying, I'm no longer prescribing opiates, I'm firing you, you are not doing anybody a favor because you're releasing to the curb people who are dependent on an opiate to survive and they will find any way to get it. So you are, again, the unintended consequences of this is you are flipping people to a much more deadly drug. If they are struggling with an addiction, you need to get them treatment. If they are my 85-year-old mother who has spinal stenosis and uses two Percocet a day, that is fine. Not because she's my mother, but because she's not addicted to her Percocet. She's struggling with long-term chronic pain. So I fight very hard for people with chronic pain who are stable on their medicine. I feel as strongly about that. So when you ask people in the country, EMS workers, what's the number one drug problem, those dark green areas, the answer is heroin. What's amazing is why the hell isn't the southeast lighting up? Like Florida's right there. What's their, what's their secret sauce? Well, their secret is that those purple states are states where there's still between one and one and a half bottles of opiate per person in the state. Those southeastern states are filled with prescribers handing out tons of pills. And the problem is that that's gonna shift fast. The next two years between the CDC, the FDA, and now as of yesterday, CVS saying they will no longer fill anything, and it's a detailed thing, but they are gonna be, CVS will be cutting off any more prescriptions. 
Those dark purple states are going to flip it fast. So when you look at the country and ask, where's the heroin problem? Those red and orange states are the heroin problem. When you look at the country and you turn those purple states red and orange and make that the heroin problem, we haven't even begun to see the people dying in this country from death of opiates. The next five years, the southeast people, I, I think we're going to have a couple hundred, a quarter million people die. Some predictions are half a million people dying of an opiate overdose in the southeast. This is a mess, right? We may be a little ahead in Massachusetts right now, without a doubt, but we're Massachusetts. Right? Massachusetts and Vermont are number one and two in the country in terms of addressing this. You think the Southeast is having forums like this at night, that they have Narcan in patrol cars, that they have Narcan in the school nurse's office, that they have district attorneys who are actually paying attention to this? You think that's happening in Arkansas, and Louisiana? I don't think so. So this is not getting better. And I don't, I'm not a negative Nancy. I'm sort of a golden retriever person, but this is concerning to me. Um, so our kids, we covered this one already. Where do they get it? The truth is most of our kids are not using much in the way of opiates, but man, as a parent, you've got to protect them. So you have a girl soccer player who gets an ACL tear, you've got a boy football player who gets injured. When you meet with that clinician who's taking care of them, the first thing you say to them, maybe not the first thing, but the third thing is, how are we going to manage their pain without exposing their brain to opiates? Give me a strategy. We're doing a nerve block. We're using a long acting. Um, numbing medicine, we're going to use IV Tylenol, we're going to use a combination NSAID plus Tylenol at the end. If my kid has cancer, I'm using an opiate. Done. Don't care, right? I'm going to make sure they're not suffering too much. But when my kid had massive oral surgery and that oral surgeon had his pen hovering about that prescription pad, I was like, dude, really? He's like, I know, I'm not going to give you this, am I? I'm like, nope. So what did I do? I did Tylenol and Motrin in conjunction on the couch. Distraction, Tylenol and Motrin, distraction, done. She didn't use an opiate, right? You can do this. It's not rocket science, but you're in charge of protecting your kids. Don't expect your doctor to do it. I'm sorry. I get to say that because I have a doctor who's watched us overprescribe for decades. So we all know this. And the numbers have gotten better. The numbers of opiate prescribing in Massachusetts are really trending down. That it really used to be that a dentist or oral surgeon would pay for 30. The statewide average is now 21. But when I've asked the question of how many pills did you use after your root canal, or after your wisdom tooth for teeth were removed. I've asked now 20,000 people, right? The answer is always, I use zero, two, four, or six, done. Nobody used more than six. One day in the back of the room, some guy shouted out, I use 60, and I'm like, man, something went wrong, right? And then the next sentence, he said, but I'm an addict. So my answer when you have a root canal is say, I'd like six or less, right? That's about the number you should use. Um, you guys have done this, but in your kid's room, I look at my kid's room, right? I want to be the parent who figures out my kid is struggling with addiction about three months in. I don't want to be the parent who figured it out three years in. I'm not a perfect parent. I don't, I'm definitely not a hovercraft parent. I expect my kids to do a tremendous amount. I don't clean their room. I don't do their laundry. I try not to walk in there to their disgusting rooms, except for this. I walk in to make sure there's not evidence of concerning behavior. A bottle of Benadryl or Motrin in my kid's room. They know the rules. There's no bottles of anything outside of the medicine cabinet. They're not allowed to take a pill without talking to me. They, are, they have pain. They need to talk to me first. Not because I'm a doctor, but because I'm a mom. And because I don't trust my kids to know the difference between Tylenol and Motrin or have any idea how to dose those things. Tylenol overdose with girls with periods is a very prominent problem. So your meds should be kept under your control. If you have controlled substances at home that are being actively used, they should be under lock and key. If they're not, police take back box, done. My alcohol is under lock and key at my house. When I put it under lock and key, my kids were like, what's up with you, mom? Do you not trust us? And I was like, no, you're right, I don't trust you. Because you're a 15 year old. Why would I trust you? I know what I did when I was 15. Why am I making this any easier for you? Um, Narcan, if you have somebody you love, you should have Narcan. Right? That's not much to ask. It's in my purse. It's in my car. And um, it's easy to get every CVS, every Walgreens in the state of Massachusetts. You do not need a prescription. It runs underneath your insurance. Just walk in and ask the pharmacist. Other places too, but those two national chains definitely have it in Massachusetts. I want to spend a minute about what it takes to get better, because I, this is the one place that I actually disagree with your great district attorney. People get better a lot. They do. It's not easy. It's hard. She takes care of people that are struggling more than the average man, right? She's, she's, a, she's worked with the DA's office. 
So she doesn't see what I see, which is I take care of primary care patients who are getting better. They're good. They're taking care of their kids. They got their electrical degree. They're nurses. They're doing well. And I happen to take people to jail. Um, they're not doing as well, but some of them get better too. And then I also run a 64-bed detox unit where I see a lot of people get better. What does it take to get better? The number one, and so for, this is what I say to people. This is a new sort of thing. When I talk to judges or when I talk to prosecutors, I say, it is complicated how you get better. There's not one path to getting better. It's not about 90 meetings in 90 days. It is complicated. Everybody has a different pot. Everybody needs a different set of things to change in order to get better. Every pot has to have on it sober housing. If you're going to go back to the same house where you used to get high, you're not going to succeed. Right? And the biggest deficit we have in the state is long-term structured sober living. We do not have it. And so when a sober house wants to move to Reading or three, my God, I hope this room says, yeah, that's a really good idea. Let's support that. Because our kids, our people, are not getting enough structured sober living available to them. And nobody can get sober without that, period. Every other piece of the pie is up to that person. Some of us need medicine. Some people need Suboxone or Methadone or Vivitrol, whatever it takes. Not everybody needs it, but lots of people do, and it helps people get better. Some people need a pet to take care of. They need a sense of purpose. They need a job. They need to be able to go back to school. They need good mental health treatment. Um, for me, I would need a lot of exercise. So everybody's pie looks different, and our job is to help figure out what they're missing and get it for them. So again, there's some pies that get really complicated. So these are great books on addiction. When you get the slide deck, you can go back and look at them. They're on my website too. But any one of these books are amazing. If you're sitting here and you think, yeah, I know too much about this. I've read all these books because I've had a, somebody I love struggle. Or you just want to learn more, you can pick up any one of these books and they're all really great. I have a website that my kids made for me because my life got a little chaotic, but I have a lot of reading materials on it. I have videos on it. Um, I have a calendar on it, so it's just my name.com. And I'm going to just leave you on this slide here. But I'm happy to take questions, knowing it's all so late that people are tired, but I'm delighted to take questions. What questions do people have? Yeah. Um, so you talked about the brain getting kind of broken and the dopamine receptors. So long as you're recovering, do you have the brain recover? You already answered the question. What does it take for your brain to get better? It takes time. And does dopamine return to the brain? Absolutely. It takes distance and time away from the substance for you to get better. And the problem is it's not five days or 30 days or 90 days. It's really about 18 months, 24 months, 36 months. It's a long time. Um, so when I take care of somebody who's on methadone or, or suboxone with me, I say, there's no, we're not talking about weaning. There's no weaning talk for a while. At 15 months, when you tell me all the great things that are going for you, how do I know somebody's better? You know how I know? Show me your bank account, right? Show me your bank account. And they're like, I have money saved, right? I'm working, I, I got two cars on the road, and I got $3,000 saved, done. I don't need to urine drug screen that person. They're good. Their life is back on track. And I say, that's awesome, my friend. What's your next step? And let's start talking about weaning you down off of some of these support meds. And sometimes they're like, I can't do that. And I'm like, good, that's fine with me. We'll keep it going. But sometimes they're like, I'm ready to do that. They get better. Dopamine gets built by exercise, by having a sense of purpose, by falling in love, by raising your kids. Dopamine does not get built in a prison cell. And I do not believe in incarcerating people for their disease of addiction. I understand that it happens in this country, but I tell you, we don't make them better in jail. In fact, those people come out a lot worse. And I don't care how great the Middlesex County House of Corrections is. It is still not a great place. And I work in a jail. I'm really proud of the work we do. I get it. Um, but they don't necessarily get better. So, jail sure as heck better be doing treatment for the way to do it work. So I have a question here and then one here. Yeah. That's a great question. Can you break it for generations? It would take generations to truly break it, I would say, because it's epigenetics and genetics that are happening at once. So the study that I didn't show you guys is it compared people who had genetic risk of addiction versus people who had no genetic risk. And it looked at the trajectories. If you postpone use of any substance that's addictive, alcohol, nicotine, 
marijuana until after age 22, that the two lines merged. That the place where you had genetic history or no genetic history, they went away. So that's what that's based on. Um, it takes generations after generations after generations to change your genetics. That's the problem. So you still need to talk about the genetic risk um, for generations further down. But I tell you, growing up in a house where there's no addictive behavior is really good modeling. That's the epigenetic changes of like, I didn't grow up in a house where anybody was using anything. It's not my normal. It is doing exactly what Erica started off this talk by saying, changing what normal behavior looks like. That makes the difference. They need, they need real treatment, they need real treatment. Going to jail is not treatment, and yet that's what we do in our Section 35s, whether it's Plymouth or Bridgewater or what you, what Framingham, that is not where people belong for a Section 35. It is actually, it's appalling, right? And if these people had real lawyers, there would be a giant lawsuit, right? That's what would happen. I'm sorry, where would be it? I know, I know that. And I've had my great people who run my Section 35s go and visit these places, and I'm like, this is not treatment. And I'm not saying I run a perfect treatment center. I don't run a perfect treatment center, but we do a tremendous amount of treatment. And I tell you, detoxes that yank you off the drug and think you're better in five days, that's crazy. It does not work that way. Yank you off the drugs and kick you to the curb. You're somebody who's just at risk of overdose. That's all you are. I know. It is. It's, it is. We have a long way to go in Massachusetts. A long way to go in terms of getting really good addiction treatment for our people who need it. There's no doubt about it. So let me take a couple more questions from a really knowledgeable crowd right here. Yeah. What's the word you're using? The prolong it? Oh, delay it. Delay use. Oh. It's very genetic, and I don't think there's a way to delay um, mental health disorders. That's the problem. They do. That's right. So getting, so what you guys are doing in Reading by getting people acknowledging that mental health is a real problem and not having it feel shameful or embarrassing in your family, and getting your 11-year-old into therapy is absolutely critical. And having therapy always be paid for, and having access to really good therapists who are good with adolescents, and being able to call this resource line that's going to help hook you up—that is amazing work. Because if you can prevent that 11-year-old from becoming a 13-year-old who starts drinking, that's the goal. I totally agree with you. I have no way of delaying a mental health disorder. It is hard to be a teenager. Who would go back and relive high school in this room? Anybody? Anybody? Oh my god, there's always one hand, and I'm like, who was that? That's amazing. Okay, most of us would not go back to adolescence because it's really hard. So getting your kid into therapy, having mindfulness meditation things being piped through the school system every single day. I would love to hear John Kabat-Zinn's voice running in 15 minutes most days, quieting our kids' brains down. You know, the devices are also really bad for the mental health of our kids, and learning to control that device is critical. And it's hard. It's the worst thing about being a parent these days. So let me take this one again. So her question was talking about the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor drugs, the Prozac, Paxils, all those medicines that are often used. I actually don't, my experience is that that isn't a gateway drug. I don't usually use the gateway drug analogy, but the, the serotonin system um, is, can be a very disrupted system in the brain. I don't deny that. I don't find that having anxiety or depression necessarily leads you down a pathway of addiction, nor has my, either my clinical experience nor does any study necessarily support SSRI triggering it. Now having said that, people who have um, ADHD are at higher risk of developing addiction. It's complicated though, because their impulse control tends to be very poor. That's the group who's like, yeah, I'm in, yeah, I'm in. That's a good idea, right? Their, their ability to put the brakes on isn't there. And so because impulse control is poor, the overlay between addiction and ADD is really quite high. 
But when you have an adult with addiction, you actually treat them for their ADD, they do better with their addiction, right? Because you're controlling some of that impulse. So I'm never the one who says, don't treat your seven-year-old for ADD because they're gonna become an addict. I actually don't believe that. What's critical to me is you've gotta make sure your kids are really, really well diagnosed because, again, I'm gonna throw Middlesex County under the bus here. There is a lot of over-treatment for ADHD in these western suburbs, right? The statistics on ADHD is about 5% of our kids. You go to some of these suburbs where our kids are under a lot of pressure to perform, they're getting treated at 20 to 30% rates for ADHD. They don't have ADHD, they have performance-enhancing drugs, right? And these kids want their, parents want their kids to go to Harvard. That's terrible. That is terrible diagnosis, that is terrible prescribing. But real kids who have real ADHD are really struggling in our classrooms, and those kids need treatment. But those are small numbers, they should be small numbers. Can I also say that trauma looks like ADHD? When you have a traumatized kid, they're impulsive, they have angry outbursts, they cannot focus, they're a mess, and it looks like ADHD. And you gotta be able to tell the difference between a traumatized kid and ADHD and get them the right treatment. So, you know, I agree that the, psych the psychotropics early on are tricky business. Look, it's a late night, you guys have gotta go home, um, but you've been a great audience. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Okay. Thank you to everyone for staying. Um, I just want to um, say to you that our next event is going to be October 17th here in the Performing Arts Center. Lynn Lyons, who's an author um, and has a, some fabulous material to share about stopping the worry cycle and dealing with anxiety, something that's impacting many of our children. Please come out for that. And also, don't forget Jams for Jake. And I invite um, the Arcasic board members to come forward um, for a few minutes for a quick business meeting. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to all of our speakers. Have a great night.